Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, we're going to talk today about best practices in critical care sedation. And just by way of disclaimer, um, I have given lectures for Hospira and Orion in the past. Um, also received research support from several companies, including AstraZeneca, the medicines company, uh, Aspect and Covidian and Canyon, and am currently involved in several NIH, National Institutes of Health, studies. Um, what we will talk about today, uh, first we will review the 2013 guidelines for pain, agitation, and delirium. Um, then we will focus in on three areas of those guidelines that represent a significant change from the prior guidelines. And specifically, we will focus on analgesia first, on light sedation, and on non-benzodiazepine sedation. Finally, we will talk about several new papers that have come out in the last year or two that may change some of these guidelines. Although these were published in January of 2013, the papers that led to those guidelines only go up to late 2011, very early 2012. So we're now two years beyond those papers. So this is uh, the, the paper, the guidelines, uh, the progress, the, the process was chaired by Julie Barr, um, and there were 21 different physicians, nurses, and pharmacists involved with writing these guidelines. They were broken up into four groups, one for pain, one for sedation and agitation, one for delirium, and one for outcomes. And each of those groups asked questions and then researched in the literature to answer those questions. And sometimes the groups came to slightly different conclusions. So I'll try to point that out when we go through. So pain, agitation, and delirium are all interrelated. And we're going to start with pain, and that's not an accident. We think it's very important for every patient that the first thing you assess is pain. After that, deal with agitation and delirium, but first, address pain. So the guidelines recommend that all patients be routinely monitored for pain using the numeric rating scale, which is a zero to 10 scale. And patient self-report is the gold standard. We know that doctors and nurses and family members are not good at trying to guess if a patient is having pain. So the best answer is the patient's own report of whether they're having pain or not. That means oftentimes we may have to lighten their sedation even more to get them to be able to tell us if they're having pain and how bad it is. If patients are not able to report their pain, we recommend using either the behavioral pain scale or the critical care pain observation tool. And we will show those in just a minute. Lastly, as far as pain goes, many times in the ICU, patients have hypertension and tachycardia and are assumed to be having pain as a result. But there are many other reasons why patients may be tachycardic and hypertensive. And we know that if you get patients and ask them if they're having pain and look at their vital signs, there is not a good agreement 
So rather than assume patients with hypertension and tachycardia are having pain, what we think you should do is use that as a trigger to use one of these assessment tools, either the NRS or the BPS or the CPOT. Now, this is the numeric rating scale, and you can see that it goes from zero up to 10. Zero is no pain, 10 is the worst possible pain. And most often, people will target trying to keep the level of pain two or less. If we can't use patient self-report with the numeric rating scale, this is one of the scales we can use instead. It's based on patient behavior. So it's called the behavioral pain scale. It looks at three things. Facial expression, upper limb position, and compliance with mechanical ventilation. And each of these three components gets scored from one, which would be associated with the least pain, to four. So if we look at arm position, one would be no movement of the arms, four would be patients who have keep, kept their arms permanently retracted. And you can see there are similar scores for facial expression and compliance with ventilation. The CPOT is a very similar tool. It looks at facial expression, body movements, muscle tension, and either compliance with the ventilator or vocalization, how well the patient can speak if they're not intubated. And each of these four areas gets scored between zero and two. Once we've assessed pain, we recommend using IV opioids as the best treatment for pain, not the only treatment. And many times there will be a role for other non-opioid uh, medications, but we think that opioids are the first line drug. And we did not identify a specific opioid. You might choose to use fentanyl or morphine or remifentanyl or hydromorphone or methadone. And what we recommend is that you know the side effects and the adverse events and the kinetics of the drug and use those to match up with your specific patient. So for instance, if it's a patient with renal failure, you wouldn't want to use morphine you might want to use either fentanyl or maybe hydromorphone as the drug of choice. If it's a patient who has QT prolongation or is having arrhythmias, maybe methadone would not be a good drug for that patient. So know your patient, know your drugs, and match the two together. Once we've assessed and treated pain, the next thing we look at is agitation. And the guidelines recommend monitoring agitation with two different tools, either the RAS, the Richmond Area Sedation Scale, or the SAS, the Sedation Agitation Scale. These have been shown to be the most reliable and valid tools. We also recommend when it comes to treating agitation using an analgesia-first approach. And this was a moderate wet recommendation, plus two. We know that using light levels of sedation have been associated with improved outcomes in the ICU, less time on the ventilator, and shorter time in the ICU. And so we recommend, this is a strong recommendation, that sedative medications be titrated to a light rather than a deep level of sedation. And we're going to spend some time in the middle part of the talk focusing on the studies that have consistently given us that answer, that light sedation is better. Now, these are many different sedation tools that have been used and published, 
and Robinson et al. did a study where they tested the psychometric properties of all of these scales and found that the SAS and the RAS were the two most reliable. This is the SAS. It's a seven level scale, three levels for uh, agitation, one level for calm and awake, three is light sedation, and a patient who scores three is someone that you may need to stimulate either verbally or physically, but you can get them to wake up. They'll shake their head, yes or no. They'll hold up one finger. They'll wiggle their toes. They will interact with you and follow commands. If you can't get them to do that, that would be a SAS of two. They won't follow commands or communicate. So there's a very black and white difference between an awake patient with a SAS of three and a not awake patient with a SAS of two. Toward the end of the talk, we're going to talk about how important it is to know if your patient is awake, especially if we're doing delirium assessments where patients may score falsely positive if they're sedated. This is the other scale that's recommended, the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, or the RAS. It has four levels for uh, agitation. Awake uh, and alert is a zero, and then five different levels of sedation. And note that I have identified light sedation here as zero, one, or two, but minus three, I think, is more likely deep sedation. Remember that for a RAS of minus three, all a patient has to do is open their eyes. They don't have to follow commands. They don't have to interact. And I'm worried that a RAS of minus three, many of those patients will not be awake. In fact, we did a study where we tested patients with a RAS of minus three to see how many were awake. And many were but 24% were not, and with the confidence interval going as high as 38%. So somewhere between a quarter and a third of patients with a RAS of minus three will not be awake. The guidelines recommend, in addition to an analgesia-first approach and light sedation, using a non-benzodiazepine approach to sedation. This was a moderate recommendation. And we recommended using either a daily sedation interruption or titration to a light sedation level. And this was a strong recommendation. We'll come back and talk about analgesia first and light sedation and non-benzodiazepine sedation in a little bit. Next, I want to move and talk about delirium. After you've assessed pain and your controlled agitation, now we should begin to assess delirium. We know that delirium has many bad outcomes associated with it. Higher mortality, longer time on the ventilator, up to 10 extra days in the hospital, and all of this results in a higher cost of care. Even after you leave the hospital, if you survive your time in the ICU, but have delirium while you're in the ICU, even once you go home, adverse events are occurring. Higher mortality even after you leave the hospital. Increasing incidence of dementia and long-term cognitive impairment. And increasing requirement for chronic care facilities instead of going home. So it's clear that delirium in the ICU is a bad thing and something that we should avoid if we can. Now, this is a study from Margaret Pisani's group who looked at survival, 100% survival up here. And then she looked at how many days in the ICU patients had delirium. And you can see that the highest survival was for patients who had no delirium zero days. If you had one to two days, look at the drop, and I'll use this so it shows up a little bit better, 
look at that drop from zero days down to one to two days, three or four days, five to nine days, and 10 or more days with a less than 20% survival at one year. So the more days of delirium, the worse your outcome. And many other investigators have shown very similar results to this. So we recommend screening for delirium with one of two scales, the CAM ICU or the intensive care delirium screening checklist. We know that coma, whether that's drug-induced coma or structural coma, is a risk factor for delirium. Benzodiazepines like midazolam and lorazepam may be a risk factor, and we don't have enough data to know if propofol is associated with delirium. Now, this is the CAM ICU. It's a four-feature scale, and you need to have both feature one, acute onset of mental status changes or fluctuations in your mental status, and these are measured with the RAS or the SAS. And you need to be inattentive, and that can be tested several ways. Inattention is one of the hallmarks of delirium. If you have both feature one and feature two, then you need either feature three, disorganized thinking, or, not both, or feature four, altered level of consciousness, which is also measured with the RAS and the SAS. So notice that if your level of consciousness is altered, you're already positive for feature four and for feature one. And then the only other thing you need is feature two. I could take any of you and give you midazolam and your consciousness would be altered. You wouldn't be at a RAS of zero or a SAS of three. And if you didn't squeeze my hands the right way, you're delirious, even though it's because I just gave you midazolam. <coughs> the other scale that's available to measure delirium is the intensive care delirium screening checklist. This works very differently. During each nursing shift, we are to assess the patient for these eight parameters. They don't all need to be present at the same time, but if they are present during that shift, you get one point for it. And if you have four or more points, that's delirium. Thank you. If you have one to three of these present during a nursing shift, that's not normal, but it's not full-blown delirium. So we call that subsyndromal delirium. Once we've assessed whether the patient has delirium or not, we recommend using dexmedetomidine because it may be associated with a lower prevalence of delirium. Now, I told you that there were four groups as part of these guidelines. The outcomes group and the delirium group both asked questions about the association between sedation and delirium. The outcomes group asked the question, have any studies been done using a specific sedative with the primary outcome to reduce the incidence of delirium? And the answer was no, there have not been any of those studies. So their conclusions were that we don't have a recommendation, we don't have any data. At the time the guidelines were written, there were no randomized studies that showed a reduction in delirium with the use of haloperidol. So the recommendations at that time were not to use haloperidol. And early mobilization, where f patients get physical therapy and perhaps less sedation, has been shown to reduce the incidence of delirium. So it was recommended. Now, the guidelines recommended the use of atypical antipsychotics, which might include haloperidol, but might also include other drugs like quetiapine or olanzapine, 
and those have been shown to reduce delirium in small studies. We do not recommend using these drugs when patients have a long QT interval or have experienced the arrhythmia torsade de point, which is associated with that long QT interval. If delirium is not associated with alcohol withdrawal or benzodiazepine withdrawal, we recommend using dexmedetomidine, not benzodiazepines, to reduce the duration of delirium. Now, those are the guidelines. And there are many more that I didn't talk about, but I wanted to focus on the most important ones. Now what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the three new concepts for state-of-the-art sedation from those guidelines. Analgesia first, light sedation, and non-benzodiazepine sedation. Analgesia first was first published back in 2005. This investigator Breen took 105 patients and randomized them to two groups. One group got sedation the way we've always done it. Give midazolam, and then if they're having pain, you give them fentanyl or morphine. But the other group got this very different approach. They got remifentanil first. And both groups were titrated to try to keep them in light sedation, a SAS score of three to four. The analgesia first patients did not get a sedative unless they weren't in this level on remifentanil by itself. And what they found was that the group receiving analgesia first were extubated 54 hours sooner than the group receiving midazolam in the usual way. And from the time of starting to wean from the ventilator to extubation, that was 27 hours faster. Interestingly, 26% of the analgesia first patients never required midazolam. Just getting an opiate and having their pain controlled was enough to keep them calm and lightly sedated. Now, there have been several other analgesia-first studies published, and they have shown a consistent response in all of the studies. Reduction in sedation use, whether that's midazolam or propofol, less time of mechanical ventilation, and improved time in the sedation target. Remifentanil has been the most studied, but there have also been studies with fentanyl and morphine. There have been no studies with dexmedetomidine or clonidine. And many times when I've given this talk, people have asked, is it an analgesia-first type of medication? So I want to talk about that because I think it might be, but we don't know that for sure. Remember that alpha-2 agonists like dexmedetomidine and clonidine work at alpha-2 receptors. And we have two places where we have lots of alpha-2 receptors. In the locus ceruleus at the top of the brainstem, and this is probably where the sedation effect occurs. But we also have a very high concentration of alpha-2 receptors in the dorsal region of the spinal cord, where epidural catheters have their effect. And in fact, it's very likely that the alpha-2 receptors in that dorsal region of the spinal cord provide a fair amount of analgesia from alpha-2 agonists. In the pivotal study that led to the approval of dexmedetomidine, this was a placebo-controlled study of surgical patients. So patients after cardiac surgery or abdominal surgery coming out of the operating room to the ICU getting randomized to either dexmedetomidine or placebo. If you're going to give a placebo to a patient who just had cardiac surgery, you better have a way to rescue them. So they could get midazolam or propofol in two different studies for sedation if they needed it, and they could get morphine for pain. And what they found is that in the placebo group, 83% of the patients required supplemental morphine. That's not a surprise. 
but only 57% of the patients receiving dexmedetomidine required any morphine. In other words, their pain 43% of the time was controlled just with dexmedetomidine. If you look at the doses of morphine in the first six hours after starting drug, the group receiving dexmedetomidine, remember only 43%, they required about four milligrams of morphine, whereas the placebo group required eight milligrams of morphine. So a little bit of data to suggest that alpha-2 agonists may have analgesic properties, but this has not yet been proven that when you use it, you're doing an analgesia first approach. But my own opinion, I think you are. Now, I want to move away from analgesia first and focused on what is perhaps the most challenging aspect of these new guidelines, targeting a lighter level of sedation. When we were doing the SEDCOM study, a study where patients were randomized to either dexmedetomidine or midazolam, I had many nurses that I had worked with for many years come up to me angry, very angry, because we were titrating to light sedation and they thought it was cruel to patients and it was a wrong thing to do. But now we have so many studies that convincingly show the benefits of a lighter level of sedation. And I want to go through them because when you see all of them, it makes it very hard to go back to the ICU and make your patient deeply sedated. So this was the first study. It was published in 1999, and what Brooke did is to randomize patients to either the existing standard of care, where there was no change in the level of sedation given unless a physician ordered a change, or a protocol that allowed nurses to down titrate sedation to try to keep patients lighter. And what they found is that although about 40% of patients in both groups ended up on continuous infusion sedation, the group in the titration protocol was only on continuous infusion for about three days, compared to more than five days in the standard group. Time on mechanical ventilation was dramatically different. 55 hours in the titration protocol compared to 117 hours in the standard care group. Time in the ICU was also shorter, 5.7 days versus 7.5. Hospital length of stay was almost six days shorter in the group that was titrated to lighter sedation. And the tracheostomy rate was half, 6% compared to 13%. So a very strong message, lighter sedation, better outcomes. A year later, John Kress did his now famous study where he did daily wake-ups or sedation interruption. Half of the patients that were randomized to standard care did not get that sedation interruption. What they found, very much like Brooke, is that the group who had sedation interruption spent shorter time on the ventilator, 4.9 days, compared to 7.3, less time in the ICU, and the incidence of diagnostic testing to answer, why won't my patient wake up? What kind of testing was that? CAT scan of the brain, lumbar puncture, neurology consultation, um, EEG. Only 9% of the daily sedation interruption patients needed that kind of testing compared to 27% in the routine care group. If you looked at how many days in the ICU, what percent of all ICU days patients were awake for even a short period of time, 86% in the daily sedation interruption compared to only 9% in the standard care group. That meant that 91% of ICU days, patients were comatose 24 hours a day. That can't be a good thing. So again, a very strong message, 
lighter sedation, better outcome. Now, one of the really important things, and we're going to come back to this at the end, is how Crest defined awake. So the nurses would come by, and no matter what the level of sedation was, they turned it off. And every 15 minutes, they would check the patient and see, can they do these four things? Can they open their eyes? Can they use their eyes to track you as you walk around the bed? Can they squeeze hand? And can they stick out their tongue? And when they could do three out of those four things, they were considered awake. And the nurses would restart the sedative medication at half the prior dose. Now note that Crest did not say opens eyes is enough to say you're awake. You had to do these other things. Remember what the definition of a RAS of minus three is. Opens eyes, that's all. The sleep study had nothing to do with sleep, all right? What it did is it compared the Brook titration approach with the Crest sedation interruption approach. So they randomized 430 patients to get either just titration or titration plus a sedation interruption. Patients could get benzodiazepines and opioids as needed, titrated to a SAS of three or four, what we consider light sedation, or a RAS of minus three to zero. And you know how I feel about the minus three. The outcomes, time to extubation, time in the ICU, and time in the hospital was identical in both groups. In other words, if you're titrating to light sedation, doing a sedation interruption added no benefit. People got, did not get off the ventilator faster. They did not get out of the ICU faster. But what they found was that the group who had daily sedation interruption required higher doses of midazolam and higher, much higher doses of fentanyl. Why is that? Because when the nurses turned the drug off and then waited several hours and then turned it back on at half the dose, they spent the next few hours catching up. They had to give boluses of midazolam and fentanyl to keep the patient without pain and at the target level of sedation. So our conclusions were, if you're titrating to light sedation, you don't need to do daily sedation interruption. But if it's a patient that you're not titrating to light sedation, if they're deeply sedated for some reason, then maybe doing daily sedation interruption might be important, as Crest showed initially. This is just the time to extubation for the two groups, and you can see that it's virtually identical. This was another study where patients were randomized to either light sedation or deep sedation. In both groups, patients received morphine for analgesia and midazolam for sedation. And you can see these were the definitions of light sedation and deep sedation. And what they found was, as everyone else has shown, time to ventilation was much shorter in the group that had light sedation, 2.9 days, compared to the deep sedation group. Time in the ICU was shorter, and the incidence of depression was only 5% compared to four times higher, 19% in the group that was deeply sedated while in the ICU. After the patients left the hospital at one month from discharge, they followed them up. And what they found is that the patients who were deeply sedated, 6% of them could not fill out a simple questionnaire. They had cognitive impairment. None of the light sedation patients had that. The deep sedation group also had higher post-traumatic stress disorder scores. 37% of the deeply sedated patients could not even remember having been in the ICU, much lower in the group that was lightly sedated. But when they did remember being in the ICU, the deeply sedated patients had disturbing memories 18% of the time, 
compared to only 4% in the lightly sedated group. And that probably had something to do with their PTSD scores. So again, a very strong message, light sedation, better outcome. These are the drug doses in this Tregieri study. The green lines are the light sedation group, the red lines are the deep sedation group, the dotted circles are the morphine doses, and the, the solid line with triangles are the midazolam doses. And if you look at baseline, the doses were not that different between the two groups. And the light sedation group stayed fairly similar for the first seven days. But look what happened with the deep sedation group. Every day the doses were going up, such that by the end of the first week, the morphine doses were approaching 120 milligrams a day, and the midazolam doses were close to 100 milligrams a day. That can't be good. So to keep a patient deeply sedated requires increasingly high doses of drug. To keep them lightly sedated, not so much. Now, this is the ABC hospital. This is the ABC trial. You've probably heard of this trial. In it, patients were randomized to either get a spontaneous breathing trial or a weaning trial from the ventilator just with their sedation where it was, or to have associated together daily sedation interruption and a spontaneous breathing trial. And what they found is that that linked spontaneous breathing trial and sedation interruption had more ventilator-free days, more time off the ventilator, shorter time in the ICU, shorter time in the hospital, and a lower mortality at one year. They also had a little bit higher arrhythmias during the breathing trial and a higher incidence of self-extubation, 10% compared to 4%. Now, many people are starting to use this ABC trial. So A is um, airway, no, let me see. Uh, We'll get to it. Uh, a, B, C, D, E. So in addition to linking the breathing trial and the awakening trial, they'll go ahead and do delirium assessment, and E is early mobility. Couple of concerns. There's no P in there for pain. Remember, the guidelines want you to first address pain. So maybe it needs to be P, A, B, C. I don't know. If you're titrating to light sedation, we know from the sleep trial that you don't need to turn off the sedation. So maybe you don't need to do the sedation interruption as part of ABCDE. Delirium was not routinely assessed at the end of the wake up. Sometimes it was assessed during sedation, and we'll talk about that. Only 20% of the screened patients, there were 1,650 of those, only 330 were enrolled, so it's a very selected group. And they would not do this study on patients with active seizures, alcohol withdrawal, increased intracranial pressure, escalating sedative doses, neuromuscular blockade, or coronary ischemia. So it does not apply to all patients. Within the last year, there's been a very important paper published by Yahya Shahabi and his group from Australia. And what they did is they looked at a period of time that was ignored in every other sedation study, the first 48 hours in the ICU. Now, the reason other studies didn't include these patients is it takes a while to get permission to enroll a patient into a study. What they did is they did not control sedation or analgesia, they just observed it. But they recorded that data right from the time the patient got to the ICU. And they followed those patients out for a year. And what they found is that the group that had early deep sedation, and what that meant was even one RAS score of minus four or minus five. Didn't have to be the whole 48 hours, one score. And that group that had early deep sedation took much longer to get extubated. And if you look at one-year mortality, or this is survival, 
the group with early deep sedation had a much lower survival. So even in the first two days of the ICU, avoiding deep sedation is an important thing. Now, in the SEDCOM study that I talked to you about a little bit, where patients got randomized to dexmedetomidine or midazolam, they were at light sedation target the same amount, about 75% of the time. But even with that constant level of sedation in both groups, the group that received dexmedetomidine came off the ventilator two days faster than the midazolam group and that was statistically significant. The patients also left the ICU a bit sooner, but that was not significant statistically. The nurses scored the patients, and they were blinded to what the drugs were. Nobody knew whether they were getting dexmedetomidine or midazolam. But the nurses scored these patients, and they asked how were they communicating, how were they cooperating with care, and how were they tolerating the ventilator. And they scored that from 0 to 10. Higher score meant more communication, more cooperative, better tolerance. And you can see that the dexmedetomidine group was scored higher for all three. I told you that I was going to come back to the importance of sedation and wakefulness when assessing delirium. Now, if you go, if you look at the CAM ICU, which we've looked at, remember that both feature one and feature four are related to level of consciousness. If you don't follow commands, if I ask you to squeeze my hand when I say the letter A and you don't do that, CAM ICU scores you as inattentive, which means you're positive here and positive here, and positive here, you've got delirium. There's a very high likelihood that lingering sedation is falsely being called delirium. And patients have to be fully awake. And I want to show you the data now that we have. When we wrote the guidelines, we didn't have any of this data. We now have very convincing data. So if you go to the icudelirium.org website, and I did this just a couple weeks ago, here's what you'll read. Most of the time, feature three, that's the disturbance in thinking, is not necessary because the reason the patient is positive is because feature four is positive. If you say the patient is unable to be assessed, that only applies with a minus four or a minus five. That's what the website says. It says if you have a RAS of minus three, you're awake enough to be tested. And there's a question in there, does it still count as fluctuation or change from baseline mental status? This is feature one. If a patient is on drugs, and the answer there is yes. Now, I want to give you a very different answer if you look at the intensive care delirium screening checklist. So in this paper in 2007, they say that changes in wakefulness and attention that were directly attributable to sedative medications were not scored as delirium points. And later say this drug-induced sedation is a desired and expected effect in the ICU it does not, in our opinion, constitute delirium. Confusing the diagnosis of coma or sedation with delirium or diagnosing delirium in the presence of coma or sedation can lead to an inflated estimate of the incidence of delirium. Now, there's other data that supports the idea that sedation is confounding delirium assessment. This is published uh, last year they looked at patients and scored their RAS, minus 5 all the way up to 4, and the nurses and doctors who were doing the assessments could say, this patient's not awake enough to assess. That's what UTA means, unable to assess. Every minus 5 patient, every minus 4 patient, that's not a surprise. Look at minus 3, 90% of those patients were thought to not be accessible. Minus two, 
50%. Minus one, 15%. So even the minus two patients may not be awake enough to assess. This is another study. They did CAM-ICU testing during sedation interruption. They did it before the sedation was interrupted and then after the sedation was interrupted. And what they found was that there was a much higher incidence of delirium if the RAS was minus two or minus three. Ninety-eight percent of those assessments were positive. Compared to if the RAS was minus one or higher, where only 54 percent were positive. Excluding the patients who had persistent coma, that left 71 patients. And 57 of them, or 80%, were CAM ICU positive at least once. But 20% of those patients, 11 out of the 57, were only positive if the RAS was minus 2 or minus 3. So they really thought that there was a confounding effect going on and that the prevalence of delirium will depend on whether you call this delirium if they're receiving drugs and not fully awake, or if you call it persisting sedation. The CAM ICU calls it delirium. The ICDSC calls it sedation. Which one's right? Well, we didn't know that until a few weeks ago. So this is data that has been published electronically, but not yet in the print in the journal. And this is available at this website. They did 102 patients, and this is the University of Chicago where Cress developed daily sedation interruption. They know how to do daily sedation interruption. They invented it. And what they found, if you do the CAM ICU before the interruption and after, you were 10 times more likely to be CAM ICU positive before, while you were sedated, compared to after. So they called this sedation-related delirium if you were CAM ICU positive while on drugs, but when you woke up, you weren't. You were awake and you were not delirious. They called that sedation-related delirium. And then they looked at those patients while they were in the ICU and for the next year. And what they found, the green line is patients who never had delirium, no delirium at all. The yellow bar are patients who had this delirium with sedation that went away when the sedation was turned off. And the red line are the patients who had persistent delirium. And if you look at ventilator-free days, very high for no delirium and the sedation effect, much lower for the group that had real delirium. ICU-free days, same thing. Hospital-free days, the delirium group had none, very similar for the two other groups. Here's the startling effect. This is survival. The yellow line is that sedation-related delirium that went away when you turned off the drugs. This is patients who never had delirium, both with very good survival compared to the group that had persistent delirium. So I think there's a very clear answer here now. These patients who are CAM ICU positive while on drugs with a RAS of minus three or minus two, maybe minus one, aren't really delirious. They act like patients who never had delirium. All right, so to kind of wrap up here now, um, regarding treating delirium, the, the guidelines said that there was no published evidence that haloperidol worked, but that atypical antipsychotics may be beneficial and did not recommend using rivastigmine. This was the data that suggested that quetiapine, an atypical antipsychotic, may work. Patients who had delirium and had already received one dose of haloperidol were randomized to get either quetiapine or placebo. And both groups could continue to get haloperidol. So in some ways, we were treating or comparing quetiapine with Haldol versus Haldol by itself. And what they found was that there was a much quicker resolution of delirium in the group that was treated with quetiapine compared to the group that got placebo and was only receiving haloperidol. 
Also, patients had less agitation with the quetiapine and a higher rate of being transferred either home or to rehab compared to dying in the hospital or going to a nursing home. Regarding non-benzo sedation, that's either dexmedetomidine or propofol because both of these, when compared to benzodiazepines, have been shown to have shorter time to extubation, less time in the ICU, and less delirium. This was the first study to show that. It was published by Maldonado. It was a cardiac surgery open-label study. And when patients were coming out of the operating room, they were randomized to dexmedetomidine or propofol or midazolam. And you can see that the incidence of delirium was 3% with dexmedetomidine compared to 50% for the propofol or midazolam. The duration of delirium, what percent of hospital days total were patients delirious? Only 1% with dexmedetomidine, 16% with propofol, 29% with midazolam. So a clear figure, a, a clear signal that dexmedetomidine is associated with less delirium. This was the SEDCOM study. At baseline, about a 60% incidence of delirium in both groups. The dark bars are the dexmedetomidine patients, the gray bars are the midazolam patients. Study drug gets started here, and within a day, the dexmedetomidine delirium rate drops down significantly. The midazolam rate is remaining high. Remember, this was a blinded study. Nobody knew what the patients were getting. The delirium assessments were done blind to study drug. This is the men's study where patients were randomized to dexmedetomidine or lorazepam, very similar effect. About 60% in, at baseline, delirium comes down a little bit more slowly in the dex group compared to the SEDCOM study, midazolam actually goes up. I mean, with lorazepam, the delirium rate goes up. Now, within the SEDCOM group, those 60% who had delirium at baseline, then study drug gets started, how often did they have persistent delirium while receiving study drug? Remember, the incidence of delirium is 100% for that 60%. Only 68% of the patients receiving dexmedetomidine ever had delirium while receiving study drug, compared to 95% in the midazolam group. So about a third of the dexmedetomidine patients, the delirium went away on dex and they never had it again. The 40% who did not have delirium at baseline, so they started a rate of zero. 32% developed it in the dex group, 55% in the midazolam group. So it looks like if you have delirium, it goes away quicker with dexmedetomidine compared to midazolam. And if you don't have delirium, you develop it less often with dexmedetomidine. These are the studies, this is going to wrap things up here. These are the studies supporting the new role for haloperidol, perhaps. So this was one of the first studies that compared dexmedetomidine and haloperidol, very small, only 20 patients, who already had delirium. They had agitated delirium at baseline. They got either continuous infusion haloperidol or dexmedetomidine. The Haldol group took much longer to extubate, 42 hours, compared to only 20 hours in the dexmedetomidine group and they spent much longer time in the ICU, 6.5 days versus 1.5 days. This is another study that suggested that haloperidol may be an effective agent to prevent delirium. You can see that patients who had a high prediction risk for delirium were randomized to haloperidol, very low dose, one milligram every eight hours and they compared them to a group that did not receive delirium. So this was not a randomized study. It was historical or parallel controls. They looked at how often those patients had delirium, what the 28-day mortality was, 
This is the group that got haloperidol. This is the group that did not. You can see that the delirium incidence was 75% without haloperidol, 65% if they were treated with haloperidol. Number of delirium-free days without coma, only 13 in this group, 20 in this group. So more days without delirium and without coma, that's a good thing. 28-day mortality, 12% compared to 7%, a lower mortality. Now, again, it wasn't a randomized study, so there might be some issues with it, but a pretty strong signal that for patients at high risk to develop delirium, very low-dose haloperidol may be effective. This was another study looking at a very not sick group of ICU patients. They were only on the ventilator for a very short time. Their, Apa their Apache 2 scores were 7, uh, 8, I guess. But what they showed, again, is that the Haldol group here um, had less time with delirium, took longer to develop their delirium. So another signal that maybe there's a role for haloperidol. Early mobilization. That's recommended by the guidelines group because it was shown to reduce delirium. Also shown to be associated with a very high attainment of functional independence, dressing yourself, walking independently. Um, much higher in the group that got early mobilization. What does that look like? Well, level one, it's just passive range of motion. Then if they do well here, they jump to level two when they may get passive range of motion, some active resistance and sitting. Then if they jump to level three, they can sit on the edge of the bed. They get to level four, they can sit on the edge of the bed, they can transfer, and they can actually walk. In order to do these things, you need to be awake, right? If you get a RAS of minus five, you can't walk, all right? And indeed, um, this early mobilization study showed that if you, once you in, in, uh, initiated with that early mobility protocol, the number of patients receiving benzodiazepines went from 96% down to 73%. The number of ICU days or the, uh, with, with any benzo use was 50%, went down to 26%. How often patients were deeply sedated? 43% went down to only 18%. Moderately sedated went from 24 to, to 14 and how often were they awake and alert? Only 30% all the way up to 67%, more than doubled. How often were they delirious? 36% went down to 28%. Uh, how often were they unable to assess because of deep sedation? 43% went down to 19. So some of the benefits clearly due to the early mobilization, but some may also be due to lighter sedation. So these are my summary slides, two left, you've made it. The guidelines recommend using the numeric rating scale or the BPS or the CPOT for patients to assess the pain and to treat pain with opiates. To assess sedation, we recommend the SAS or the RAS and either sedation interruption or titration. If you're titrating to a light level of sedation, there does not appear to be a role for sedation interruption. We recommend an analgesia first approach. We recommend targeting light sedation. And we recommend non-benzodiazepine sedation with either dexmedetomidine or propofol. To assess delirium, we recommend the ICDSC or the CAM-ICU early mobilization, atypical antipsychotics, and if the delirium is not due to withdrawal from benzodiazepines or ethanol, we recommend using dexmedetomidine. We do not recommend using vital signs to diagnose pain, and remember we said no role for haloperidol for prevention, but that's now maybe going to have to change. Um, lastly, Remember how easy it is for that sedation to confound delirium assessment. You need to be awake to be assessed for delirium. That's a SAS of three or four. 
We're not sure what RAS level it is. It's probably almost certainly not minus three. May not be minus two. Some people have recommended maybe it needs to be zero. But the easy way to do it is use those Cress wake-up criteria. Opens eyes, tracks with eyes, squeezes hands, sticks out tongue. Right? They can do three out of four of those, they're awake. And there may be a role for Haldol for preventive therapy. Thank you very much.